if you notice, I do have a brightly colored shirt on here uh, this morning. And that's for a reason, because, man, with everything going on, we have our deep conference coming up. Man, I, I pray that you can make it come expecting, as Pastor Daryl said, I have some friends of ours, Tommy and Miriam Evans coming from from Dallas, from Trinity Church there just to bring some. I mean, they operate in this prophetic uh, gifting and anointing. That I mean, so basically they have a service every Saturday night there at Trinity, really just to light a fire under the pulpit. I think that's their job. And uh, so they're just going to pray, you know, prophetically. They operate in healing. They've been traveling around the United States, just opening up the wells of revival with with other revivalists like uh, the uh, who's the guy from uh, Larry Starks is one of them and. Uh, the the man who's the other guy the uh, the guy from California who Mario that they, they're traveling with Mario and Jesse Green a different Jesse Green not our Jesse Green Griffin and and anyway I'm just excited about what God's going to do I have a great expectation that God's going to begin to open up the wells of revival here in our region because how many of you realize there are wells of revival in our region I, I mean okay a couple of y'all believe in that. I'm believing it, really believing it, but, but more importantly, so, so that's what's happening, but, but we're going to take, last time, two years ago, me and Shannon and JP, we had an opportunity to go to Africa, and uh, we went and did some ministry there in Cote d'Ivoire, which is Ivory Coast, it's on the western part of western Africa, uh, kind of on the bottom of the bump, you know, and uh, it's where all the hurricanes come from for the most part. And uh, man, I really was was encouraged and awakened to some things there. For one, last time that I went, I mean, our whole vision for how we're going to pursue ministry came from that trip. I saw revival in Ivory Coast, where uh, it's it's a country a little bit bigger than the size of Arkansas, and uh, they are believing and contending to plant two thousand Assembly of God Spirit filled Holy Ghost churches in that country in the next 10 years. They have right now 3,000 churches in operation, a full-on pastor school, and, and all of the churches are, are growing and thriving. There is no such thing as a dead church in Ivory Coast. Why? Because they're contending for the faith. Like, there are real, real problems there. And let me tell you, friends, like, we're seeing real problems begin to develop here. And if the church doesn't begin to push back the work of darkness in the land. Come on, how many of you know the church is going to go away? And, and in Africa, it's it, there in West Coast Africa, most of the countries around them are just being completely inundated with Muslim influence. And you may say, well, Joe, why are you so mad at the Muslims and the Islams? Well, it's because they hate Christians. And they may not say it, but their whole religion and basis of understanding is against God. It's against the gospel. It's against truth. And it may be brave to say things like that, but that's just the truth, friends. And, and what's happening, while me and Shannon were there last time, churches are just thriving and there's revival and God is moving and miracles are taking place and, and women are being delivered out of prostitution and addiction. And, and the church is, and so many people are coming to Christ, the church doesn't even know what to do with them. There's so many people who are being transformed by the power of the gospel. But while we were there, I mean, they had uh, just uh, just to the north part of the country, uh, some Muslim Islamic terrorists came into a church and, and basically murdered everybody in it. And, and right there in Ghana and Liberia and all of these countries, persecution is coming. And, and right there in Ivory Coast is like this bright burning flame of the gospel. It, it, it's like this. It's this candlestick. It's this city on a hill that, that the enemy's trying to put a bushel basket on. And, and in that moment, I realized that if we want to be strategic about reaching the nation of Africa, then we need to begin to invest in a country like Ivory Coast and Cote d'Ivoire, where there's a strong Christian presence and they're beginning to do the work of the ministry. And through your faithful giving a couple of years ago, we were able to purchase a truck that, um, that, that, that they used to up all of their crusade and revival equipment, and they travel around the country doing crusades and seeing thousands of people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it's really amazing and freeing. It's awesome. It's exciting. And we're excited to go back. And, um, and, and I'm hoping that not only 
Or, or am I going to come back with a fire, but I'm hoping that we can bring some fire from here and go make an investment into the fire there in Africa. Amen? Amen? Come on, man. Y'all got to do something. Get excited about it or something here this morning. Be, because I'm believing for it. I'm contending for it. So, so what I, what I want to do, and, and I'm believing that that's some fertile ground over there. It's not like a lot of missions giving. We're actually giving into the church, and we're making an investment from our church into the churches there in Africa. It's fertile ground. It's fertile soil. It's soil that's being tilled and cultivated, and the, and the weeds and the thorns of worldliness are being yanked out of the church, and you're really seeing some amazing things happen. So I, I'm asking you today, if you're interested and you want to sow some seed into the ground in Africa, I want to give you an opportunity to do that here today. So if you, it, it, I, just, I just want to take a moment and pray. I'm, I don't really ask for tithes or, I mean, I ask, you know, the tithes and offerings will receive that, but I don't really ask for donations or gifts. And, and quite frankly, God provides, but I just want to give you an opportunity to sow into some fertile ground. It's like, I don't want to just go and, I mean, you're sowing in by sending me and sending Pastor Daryl and sending Pastor Travis and sending JP, and we know that that's some good stuff, but I'm like, if you want to sow some seed into the ground in Africa, I want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning. And I've, in, in the three and a half years of pastoring, I don't know that I've ever specifically asked for something like that, but I, it's really just giving you an opportunity to do it. Because I believe that God's going to bring great, great rewards and great fruitfulness from that investment. Great souls that are being reached for the gospel. So, um, I guess we have some buckets on the platform. We'll just, we'll just utilize those. So uh, right now, I just want to, if, if you want to make an investment and just take a step of faith, a step of, of just saying, hey, I'm going to sow a seed, if you will, just, just come, put the, come put that seed in the bucket and I'll carry it with me to Africa and I'll go sow it into that nation. So um, outside of it, just getting really awkward for a moment. Um, if you, if, yeah, so all it takes is one. Just get up and come bring it. So amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. <clears throat> and so, so literally 100% of that is going to go to missions work in Africa and preaching the gospel. We're going to, we're, the, the kind of the goal and the role that we're going to have and play is Pastor Travis is going to be doing some work um, teaching the, the youth pastors and the children's ministers there as, as part of the Assembly of God organization, potentially five to 600 youth pastors and children's pastors across the nation. Pastor Daryl is going to be doing a conference talking about uh, uh, our care ministry network, but also talking about bereavement and grief uh, and, and those things that go a part of that. Just the, the basic, the, the, the boots on the ground, dirt, a hand in the dirt work of pastoral ministry. And then, and then I'll be, we'll be also doing a crusade three nights. So that's going to, we're going to leave October 27th. We're coming back November 9th. And, and I'll be posting a lot of this stuff on on Facebook and just giving you updates. But on these crusades, I need you guys praying for us because we're going into the public square, into the public markets. And what they've done is they've rented a, a soccer field complex and they're going to set up a huge stage about the size of this one and with lights and speakers. And these soccer fields are surrounded by apartment complexes and they start playing music and dancing and they got the bright clothes and people just start coming by the by the hundreds and by the thousands and, and just to hear. And then we have an opportunity just to make a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and give them an opportunity to respond in salvation. I learned my first lesson in ministry while I was in Africa. I, I was we, we had preached and it was great. And JP did a, a wonderful job preaching for me, on uh, uh, interpreting for me. It's really difficult. The enemy hated us being there. Uh, he hated it. In fact... While we were there, they had to rent some generators while we were there. And the generators quit working. This, was, this is supernatural, by the way. It's totally supernatural. Everything, all the lights, the sound, everything was connected to these generators. The generators quit working, but the sound system kept working. The, all the lights, it was completely dark, okay? Lesson number one, Travis and Daryl, if you have an iPad, put on an iPad, that backlight. You're, you might need it if you have notes. And um, but it was completely dark, complete darkness. It was just like the little glow of my iPad. And but yet, it, like, I don't know. They couldn't explain it to me. I didn't, you know, 
the sound system, this huge PA system, is still working. And I'm preaching to in complete darkness. It's like you couldn't see your hand in front of your face kind of darkness. And there is literally 10,000 people out in front of me, you know, and I'm like, just keep preaching, Joe. I'm telling myself, just keep preaching. Like, kind of like Dora swimming to this abyss. And I'm just preaching, preaching. And then, I mean, the lights come on and, you know, hey, they're still there. And, and you know, I can hear the, the hum of the generator again. And, and uh, I said, you know, because I'm a great man of faith, I'm, but I'm used to American faith, Christianity. And so I said, hey, if, if you want to give your heart to Jesus and, you know, make Jesus your Lord and Savior today, you know, I want you to respond to this altar. Then I said, because, because of my lack of faith, I'm like, or if you want to be healed and want a healing touch, and the pastors are like, no, no. I'm like, oh my God, what are you doing? So I have to preach. I learned I have to preach two messages. I have to preach a salvation message, and then I have to preach a healing message because when we gave the call for salvation, you know, a thousand or more people respond. And, and the church workers, they, they build a human barrier around all of these people and, and they have note cards, and they're going to each and every person. We pray for them and do all that. And they're getting names and phone numbers because they understand the value of discipleship. I mean, it's one thing to make a, a, a faith statement. I want to get saved, but it's totally something else to surrender yourself and submit yourself to the leadership of a Christian mentor and be discipled. And they understand the value of that. And I believe that that's why they're seeing such, such fruitfulness in their ministry, which led to our vision of being a church that disciples and educates. And that's kind of the first part of our vision. And then evangelism, of course, and then pastoral care. Is, that's kind of what we do. And then after that, so now I'm, you know, I'm, I've exhausted my notes. So it's like, i got to preach another message on, on, on healing now. You know? So I'm like, okay, God, I just, you know, you do the whole, okay, there we go. All right. Not, not really, but, but preach another message on healing. And then, you know, that's when, the, that's when it gets exciting. There, as we pray and see God do wonderful, amazing, miraculous things, and uh, we we had a lady in the who who bought a kid up in a wheelchair. JP's, I don't see him here, but she brought this little boy up in a wheelchair, a little girl. I'm sorry, in a wheelchair. She's sitting there, and of course, I'm praying. I'm like, you know, God, you know, make her walk. I mean, you know, this is I don't really know. They're speaking another language, and it's there's people all around. I'm praying for this little girl, and she just begins to say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah, as I'm praying, the mom just passes out on the ground. And I'm like, is she okay? I don't know what's happening. So, um, so anyway, right after that, the little girl gets up and walks off. And I'm like, okay, this more is going on here than maybe I understand. And, and the reality is, is the girl, she could walk. I mean, that wasn't why the mom wheeled her up in a wheelchair. She had some struggles. She challenged she was struggling to walk, but this girl was about 10, 11 years old. She had never spoken a word in her entire life. And, and when she began, the little girl began to say, Hallelujah, the mom had never heard her daughter's voice. And, and I, I, I got the, the, the opportunity, the honor just to be there as God just opened up her mouth. And her first words was, Halala Yahweh, Hallelujah, praise be to God. You know, and that was that was amazing. You know, so sir, fer, fertile soil, indeed, indeed. Amen. I'm gonna uh, get into the word this morning. I want to read from the book of Mark, chapter 11. We're gonna be reading verses 20 through 26 here this morning, and I believe that that God has. You know, I got the so so Brian. Just in case you're wondering, I did get woken up at four four o'clock this morning. With a word, Lord, you know, it was like this whole, I had a message written out and God woke me up and said, nope, say this. I was like, ah, okay, can you give me, like, God, can you give me this stuff earlier in the week? Uh, but I think he's like, no, if I gave it to you earlier, Joe, you're going to put your spin on it and mess it all up. So, um, so I'm just being obedient. So Mark chapter 11, verses 20 through 26, and, and, I, and I'll, read, I'll read through that if you'll read with me. Here this morning, it says, Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him that Peter sang to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed 
and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them or forgive him. That your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Can we go to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace and mercy. Lord, I pray that you open our ears to hear. Lord God, Lord, open our mouths to speak. Lord, open our hearts to receive the goodness of your grace and mercy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I, I want to just kind of continue a series I started last week. And, and uh, man, I, and it goes with this whole idea of Jesus is saying simply, He says, have faith in God. And, and I want to specifically talk about faith here today and, uh, and, and just kind of open up some things because I believe that, that many of us would have hope for a move of God. Come on. How many of you believe that, that people hope that God shows up? I mean, even... even Unbelievers say, God, do something. When, when things go bad, the first words out of their mouth are, oh, God, oh, Jesus. I mean, many people would hope for God to show up. I, I'll talk to church people. Man, I hope, I hope God shows up for church this morning. Well, you know. And, and many people would even believe for a move of God. I mean, I'll believe for it. I'll, I'll pray about it. I'll, I'll pray for a move of God. I believe that it's progressive. We can go from a hope to a belief. But what I, what I'm, what I struggle with, and and one of the ideas that I'm I'm really trying to to wrap my head around is 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 how many of us would have faith for a move of God. You see, it's one thing to hope for a move of God. It's another thing to believe for a move of God. But it's something altogether different for to have faith for God to do something in our community, in our city, in our church, in our family. I mean, so, so I've been on this journey of faith and saying, God, you know, I want to have mountain-moving faith. And he said, that's great, Joe. He said, I mean, there's a quote that said, if, 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 you believe, if you have faith for God to move mountains, don't be surprised when he hands you a shovel. Sometimes when we have faith for something, God requires something from us. And, and I'm believing... And I'm having faith that God is going to do something in our community, in our families. I'm believing for a revival. I'm contending for a revival. And, and how many of you realize that their revival, when God shows up and things start taking place, it's, it's never really convenient. It's like, you know, oh, you might have to miss a, a birthday party or you might have to miss a, 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 the Saints play football and, and you might have to miss an LSU game. It's not really football. I don't know what they were playing yesterday. But they, you might have to miss. I mean, that, that, where's David Clark? I bet you, man, did you watch the A&M game, David? Yeah. That's an Alabama fan. <laughs> Faithful to the end. But when we have faith for something, man, we begin to prioritize our lives a little bit different. I, I believe if we want to see revival, all it really is required is for the body of Christ to say, to have faith and believe and show up when God begins to show up and do things. And, and our sense of mutual expectation will begin to move the throne rooms of heaven. The 120 in, in, the, in the upper room, they were contending. They showed up day in and day out. I mean, could you imagine showing up for nine days and relatively nothing taking place? Nine days of prayer, nine days of intercession, nine days of seeking after God and nothing taking place, but they had faith to believe. See, faith can keep you where you need to be with God. Some will hope. I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of... There was, it started off with 500 who, who saw Jesus and 500 who believed, 500 who had hope, and maybe 500 believed, but it was only 120 who had faith. To show up, it was like if I can give a bunch of examples, but I'm not going to do that. But I want to talk about faith specifically, and I'm doing this series. It's called Move, and 
And, 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 and we're going to talk about faith because I believe faith is important for us to talk about. I want to talk about doubt. I mean, how many of you, uh, our nation, there's a, there is a mountain that casts a shadow of doubt over our entire nation. There, it, there, the enemy is at work intentionally sowing seeds of doubt in our schools, in our communities, uh, even in our homes, in our media. I mean, even the, the TV stations we allow our kids to watch are sowing seeds of doubt that are going to grow to full-on weeds with thorns as these kids grow older. And until the church begins to realize that it's our role to introduce faith, I want to talk about faith, doubt. I want to talk about prayer and believe, believing. I want to talk about for forgiveness over these next few weeks. But today I want to talk about faith and, and talk about this through this story that Jesus shares. But I want to give you a little bit of context here this, this morning before we begin. It starts off with this thing that says, now in the mornings, Jesus passed by, they saw a fig tree. And, and, and the reality is, is that the day after Jesus entered into the I mean, if, you, if we can kind of back up a little bit, Jesus enters in, he's entered into Jerusalem. He has this triumphal entry. They have this big parade. They're saying, Hosanna, glory to God. The son of David is here. Oh, the Messiah has come and he, he has this grand entry. And then he goes back to, to Bethany where he was sleeping at night. And the next day he's going back to Jerusalem. It's part of this holy week that Jesus is in. And, and on his way to Jerusalem, he, it says that Jesus was hungry and and I mean, we can theologize all of this all we want, but let's just kind of keep it simple. I mean, how many of y'all are walking and you see something that's appetizing or you walk past or you drive past a, a, a restaurant and you smell the food and your stomach just goes... Blah, 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 blah. It's like, whew, I'm hungry. And I don't know, maybe Jesus, He looks and He sees this fig tree full of leaves far off and He's just like, man, that has made me hungry. Because Jesus liked to eat good, fresh food, you know, right off of the fig tree. And he goes to this fig tree, and it says that the tree had leaves, but it had no figs because it was not fig season, but it still made Jesus hungry. So Jesus says this word. He just simply says, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. You see, Jesus had this hope that was stirred up within him. He saw the tree. It didn't have the fruit, so he kind of curses the tree in a sense. And, and then they go into Jerusalem and, and they go into the temple. And I believe that in that same day as Jesus sees this, this fruit tree that doesn't have any fruit, He goes up a mountain and He sees this temple that, that doesn't have a God. And, and, and He sees this hope and expectation and all these people, they're coming together, but they're not really worshiping God. They've set up in, in their midst uh, money-changing tables and sales booths and and, and in fact, they set all that stuff up in the, in the court of the Gentiles. So, so Jesus is furious and he's, he says, may, may no one eat the fruit from you ever again. And he begins to throw over tables and, and says, this is house should be a house of prayer for all nations. You see, and what it was is that the church at that time, the temple had just made itself a house for its own purposes instead of a house for all nations. And and this kind of got Jesus a little bit upset. And so he, he's, he's done with that. He goes back to Bethany and, 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 and the next day he comes out again and him and Peter, are, they notice this tree and Peter's like, Jesus, the tree that you, that you had said that no one would eat, look, it's withered up and it's dried off and uh, it's dried up and it's dead. And, and Jesus makes this comment. It's like, how many of y'all have a dad who never misses an opportunity to teach you something? Yeah, yeah, Abby. We're going to talk about this later. It's got a great teaching moment. I'm just picking. But, but I mean, that's kind of how, that's what dads do. They, they take opportunities to, to teach and to educate. So, 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 G, so Peter's enthralled by this tree, and Jesus simply says, have faith in God. And he's like, he says, hey, have faith in God. Your faith. You, you worried about some tree. He says, have faith in God. He says, for, for if you had faith uh, in, in God, you can say to this mountain and, and it would be moved. It would be cast into sea. He says, have faith in God. And, and I want to talk about having faith that can move mountains because how, we need to have faith. I mean, faith is like the essence of our, of our existence. It's the essence of who we are. 
Uh, I just want to quote Thomas Aquinas. He says this. He says, to one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. And then he says, to one without faith, no explanation is possible. I'm like, that, that's some truth right there. I mean, it, it, it's like people who don't believe, like you can, I can sit up here and preach until I'm blue in the face, but, but people who believe, I can just say Jesus and we should all fall to our knees and worship. And, and, and this, is, this is what faith is. It, it's something that's within us. It's something that's powerful. And I want to give you some things today that I'm having faith for. I'm, this is, I'm believing for revival. I'm believing for God to do something. I'm believing for God to awaken this community with the power and reality of, a, of the risen Savior. But, but I, I'm kind of process driven and I'm, I have to take small steps because I don't have that kind of faith that Peter has to just step out of the boat. So I'm, I'm more of a process guy. And so, so I have some specific things that I'm believing for. And I'm asking you to believe with me, to have faith for these things with me. And the first one is that the wells of revival will be opened up in this region. That, that we don't, this isn't a new thing that God is doing. I think that's an important understanding. It's, it's not like, like Job got, you know, woke up at four o'clock in the morning. Oh, it's time for revival. No, I, I mean, uh, this, this church was planted and founded in 1952 with one idea was to reach the last of the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ in Acadiana. The mission has not changed. I mean, maybe the appearance has changed, but the mission has not changed. There is a deep well of revival. And it's not just from this church. It's, it's from the Catholic charismatic movement where thousands and thousands of Catholics were saved, baptized in the Holy Ghost and begin to seek after God in a new and powerful way. And, and then you have the Jesus movement hippie people. Man, they would just show up to church and sit on the floor with no shoes on and blue jeans and all the... The, all the, the jacket guys got upset because these hippies didn't wear deodorant. I mean, I get it. But they needed Jesus. And I mean, there's wells of revival that, that are plugged off by, as we sang today, we get plugged off by, by religion and tradition. When we get comfortable, man, my job is, is twofold. One's to encourage you and to keep you off balance. I mean, that's why I changed the way we do offering. That's why I changed the, how we sing. That's why I changed it. I don't want you ever to get comfortable with the status quo. And this is what we expect at church. Only thing I want you to expect is a move of God. <laughs> Open up the wells of revival. The, the, the second thing I am believing for is heart transformation through the revelation of God's love. I can't believe for a whole community to be changed. But let me tell you what I can believe for. One person's heart to be changed. Man, one person could become a catalyst for a whole neighborhood to be transformed. One person whose heart is transformed can be a catalyst for a whole school to be reached for the gospel of Jesus Christ. All it takes is one person whose heart is changed and transformed by the revelation of God's love, and this whole community begins to change. Man, Christianity, hope is contagious. I'll just say that. Hope is contagious. Y'all want to really make a difference in the world? Instead of uh, posting a bunch of negative co comments about what the government's doing wrong and about what our governor's doing wrong and all that stuff, get on Facebook and start talking about the hope of Jesus Christ and see what He can do. I, you can change a heart today that may be the next president of this country, that may be the next governor of this state, that may be the next mayor or city council member. Uh, the, the, the goal is to change hearts transformed with the power of the gospel. The third thing I'm believing for is for an awakening of spiritual hunger within this generation. Well, I, I don't know what, may, maybe it's the millennial Jesus movement. You know, maybe it's the Gen X Jesus movement. Maybe it's the whatever Jesus movement. I want Jesus to move within this generation. And, and all I'm here is just to be the wind and the sails of them as they pursue after God with truth and love and hope and grace. That's it. Look, just, God, just stir up a hunger. And you see it with all these worship movements and, and things begin. Man, the music that's coming out today is touching the throne room of heaven. And you know, it's not like the professional musician people anymore. It's like these, I mean, it's like the, the, the Pearl Jam Nirvana people grew up and they turned into some awesome Jesus people. I don't know how to explain that, but it's, some of y'all get it, maybe some of you don't, but, but it's like, man, God is, 
It's, it's, the, it's like the indie crowd. Yeah, does that make sense? To some? Indie is like the independent music people. It's being birthed out of a heart, man. It's out of a hunger. The, the fourth thing I'm believing for is that the bondage of sin will be broken from the lives of a core of believers. And, 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 I, and this is why I say that. In John chapter 17, Jesus gives this long prayer and he says, he says, he says, I'm praying for my disciples that their hearts would be sanctified towards God and that they would go and reach others whose hearts would be sanctified towards God. Man, I pray for our government. I pray for, I pray for everybody, but I'm praying specifically like for our staff and for the people who are close to me. I'm praying for all of you too, but I'm asking God to purify, to reach, to break the bondage of sin off of a small group of people that can be seeds that go out into our communities and transform them by the power of God's love. You see, there's a progression, a, a heart transformation, an awakening of spiritual hunger, God beginning to break off the bondage of sin in people's lives. And then finally, there are five, is that God would raise up an army of believers to declare the truth of God's word throughout this region. That, that I mean, I have visions and see that, that, that God is just going to begin to raise up evangelists and pastors and ministers that would go stand on the street corners in Lafayette, that would stand on the street corners in New Iberia, that would stand on the street corners of Milton and Maurice and Broussard and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and hearts would begin to be transformed. Spiritual hungers would begin to awaken and the bondage of sin would begin to break off and then this army begins to grow. That's what I mean. And maybe you're not a preacher, but I see people sharing the love of Jesus in their workplaces, in their classrooms. Man, the most powerful force on the earth is a Christian who is free from the bondage of sin operating in a public school classroom. I love our I love all of our Christian schools, but I am challenging you. If you're a teacher and you are a born again believer, I know it's easy to go get a job working at a Christian school, but I'm challenging you. Go get a job working at a public school because our ch kids need you. They need you. Man, I, I mean, I, I have kids in high school, and I'm like, they tell me stories. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. We need Christians in schools. I mean, I can get mad. I'll show up at a PTA meeting, a PTO meeting, a... a NAACP meeting, I'll show up whatever meeting I got to go to, but the best way to change is to sow seeds into the schools. And, and then finally, the last thing, number six, is I'm praying for prodigals to come home. I'm praying for those who, who, have, who know the love of God, who know the love of Jesus, who have felt that, that had that heart transformation, that have had a, a hunger, and that hunger has grown dormant, and they've walked away, and, and that they would come home. And, and I'm praying that in that process, the church would just be a church that would just have I, we put a sign up. Jesse put it up in the, in the lobby. It just says, welcome home. I want us to practice those words together. When the prodigals come home, well, they smell different. They look different. Maybe they're not all buttoned up and classy like you hope they are, but I don't care. We're going to break out the ring. We're going to break out the robe. We're going to break out the sandals. Come on, we're going to slaughter the, the fatted calf. We're going to have a Jesus celebration party for every one of them. I, I mean, that's just what we're going to do. And I want us to practice those words. Welcome home. So, so let's say it together. Ready? One, two, three. Welcome home. That's our response. I, if, you have, if you have it, this stirring in your heart to say, well, if only you wouldn't have got caught up with the wrong people, you were in the wrong place. I ain't saying it. Because I've been caught up with the wrong people. Man, it's not about where people have been. It's about where people come back home to. And most people can live a life of sin and, and they live, they fall away. They forget that they're loved. and They come back to the only place that loved them and they realize that there ain't no more love in the house. Because we let the brother make the rules. But I want to talk about stirring up faith. That's what I'm believing for. I want to talk about faith that moves mountains. Faith that... O opens the wells of revival. Friends, it takes faith, not hope, not belief, but faith. That means actionable steps that accomplish a substantial goal in life. I can come in here and pray, Lord, send revival, send revival, send revival, send revival, send revival, and that's great. And God probably will at some point in time because He's going to find somewhere else to use and He's going to send them out to go and minister to the people in the streets. And then they may come to our church. 
But I was like, Lord, send me. This is, this is what Jesus says. He's, he says this. He says, he says, look, he's looking out. He says, for the fields are white for harvest. He's like, there, there's people everywhere. There, there, there's opportunity everywhere. I was having a conversation yesterday about church planning and stuff like that. And like, man, we feel, oh, we got a great church. We're doing good. And there's other churches that are doing good. You know, there's about 280,000 people in the Lafayette Metroplex, roughly, give or take, you know, tens of thousands. And, and I, I would just be curious to do a census and go say, hey, how many of all of these people are faithful, church-attending, Bible-believing Christians? And I'd be willing to bet you, just to, this is just a ballpark guesstimation, 40, 50,000. And I'm, I'm being hopeful. And, and we're like, hey, we're doing good. Friends, that's like, I don't know, I'm not a percentage guy, 20%-ish? I mean, some of you... Somebody give me a head shake if that's 20-ish percent. Come on, 25, 10%. I don't know. Nobody's giving me anything. So it's not enough. That's how about that? It's not enough. So what do we need to do to change that? We need to pray for revival. We need to pray for heart transformation, family revival, family. We need to pray for individuals. We need to pray for spiritual hunger. We need to pray for bondage of sin to be broken. We need to pray for sanctification from a core group of believers that go out and build an army of Christians that bring the prodigals home. I have heard so many stories. I mean, it's like, and then stories that I don't even hear, but of just since we've been praying this. I'm, did I tell that story last week about the phone call I received? No, I didn't tell the story. So we're praying for prodigals to come home. And, and, and I was listening to this song. It's called The Ring in the Robe by Maverick City. And uh, as I'm, I, I'm just listening to the song, and, and, and the guy who's singing the song begins to prophesy. And he says this. He says, you know, the, 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 the prodigal, the people you know who are far from God, they may not come back to Jesus today. They may be still in the bar. They may be still far away. He says, but I'm prophesying that today you're going to receive a phone call. And listen, I'm not kidding you. I come in from the gym and, me and Shannon are back there, or, or, or I don't remember what I was doing exactly, but my phone begins to ring, and it was a number I didn't know. I answered it, and it was someone I hadn't talked to in probably five years. And, and, and just said, hey, I work at this place, and, and, and I was looking through all of our clients, and your church is on our client list, and I figured that you could really help us with this problem. And I'm like, huh, huh. Like, you could prophesy over the radio. The prodigals are coming home. Why? Because we're pursuing God's heart in this. But this is, I have three points. I'll, make, I'll get through them quickly. One, faith is essential. I believe in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, but without faith it is impossible to please Him or to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. I, I, rem I mean, faith is an essential part of our Christianity. I remember when the kids were younger, man, I, would, I, I loved Christmas time. I would buy them these, these Christmas presents. Christmas was awesome. And, 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 and there's just all this anticipation. They see for months these presents underneath, or weeks maybe, presents under the tree. And, and, and they come on Christmas Day. And, they, and if you don't like theologically Christmas, come talk to me. They open up the, the box and it's like, oh, this new toy, this new gadget, this new thing. And it's like, it's awesome. There's excitement. And then we realize, we open it up, put it all together. And then we see on the box, it says, batteries not included. And it takes like 17 AA or, or no, 17 D batteries. You know, it's like not where you're going to go spend a small fortune at CVS to put batteries in this thing. But anyway, the CVS is closed because it's Christmas day. And, and you realize, man, it's like, this device, all this anticipation, this hope is kind of pointless because we don't even have batteries to put in it. Like the, the kids opened it and there was all this anticipation. It's okay, Abby. Don't cry. I don't know you're bringing up memories here. But, but it's like that's kind of how our, 
Our, our Christianity works sometimes. Sometimes, like we show up to the Bible studies, we show up to the prayer meetings, and we, and we show up to church on Sunday, but we don't have batteries in, inside of us. So it just looks like this electronic device that looks cool on the shelf, but it's really useless. You see, faith is like putting batteries into our prayer life. Faith is like putting batteries in, into our worship. It's what fuels us. It's what charges us. It's what animates us. It's what gives us the power to operate is, is our faith. Have faith in God, Jesus says. Not in your understanding, not in the things of this world. See, faith is not a show. It's the very thing that keeps us going. Without faith, we're, we're powerless against the schemes of the devil. If you don't have a faith, uh, that's firmly grounded and rooted in the truth of Jesus Christ. Man, anything can shake you from, from your relationship with Jesus. It can just be a simple sickness or, or a simple foreclosed home or, 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 or a kid who walks away or, or, or some temptation that comes in your life. If you don't have faith, you're powerless. I, I'm encouraging you to begin to build faith because faith is the very essence of God within us. Uh, so I, I want you to understand that God created us in the image and likeness of God. And, and, and God created us humans for one simple purpose. You can find that purpose in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. It says, and God blessed them, this being humans, being us. Hey, let's pause for a second. Say, God blessed me. Ready? Three, two, one. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves that we're blessed. Travis and Daryl, we're going to a place where we're going to be reminded of the blessings of just being an American. There's blessing there. But God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. You see, uh, faith is the very thing that gives us the ability to have dominion. When, whenever the, the sin happened, Adam and Eve were in the garden. The, the, the devil came and he took the authority from, from mankind. We gave it up to the devil. And, and in that, we lost faith in self. We lost faith in God. We lost our ability, our relationship with the one true God. And then we became powerless to have dominion over the earth. And in fact, now I even believe that the earth is beginning to have dominion over us. You see, faith is the very thing that allows us, as created in the image and likeness of God, it allows us to move beyond the realm of repeat and into the realm of create. I, I want to just kind of clarify that. See, faith, just, just w without faith, if we don't have faith, then we just begin to do the things that we see other people doing. We begin to see the, do the things that our parents did. We fall into this trap of tradition. We fall into this trap of religion. We fall into this trap of just people telling us what to do, telling us how to do it. We just fall into this trap of repeat, Repeat. We wake up in the morning. We brush our teeth. We eat breakfast. We go to work. We, it's just repeat. And the devil wants to keep you in a faithless life. But see, with faith, it puts us into a, a, an operation of create. I, I mean, I want you to think about that. Faith is not just some hokey, mysterious concept. Faith was seeded into us by God. It says, in fact, that, that in, in Romans ch chapter 2, verse 3, God has dealt each of us a measure of faith. You see, we each have a little measure of faith within us. It's faith that, that, that says to a man one day as he's walking and sees a city over here across a river and says, we're going to build a bridge. And he can pray for the bridge. He can hope that there's a bridge. He can believe that, 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 that there's going to be a bridge that's going to come across. But until he begins to put faith, which is hope in action, and, and, and see, that's, faith is seated within us by God to do things that have never been done before. That's why if you go to Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about men of faith. Abraham who left his, his family. Noah who built an ark. Great and wonderful things that have never been accomplished before. Faith is, is that creative aspect of humanity. We invented cars. We, we create cures for diseases. We reach out to people and pray for them. Why? Because we have faith. We support missions around the world. Why? Because God seeded something in us. It's faith. It's expectation. It's something new. It's something different. Is this making any sense? And, and when we begin to apply our faith to our belief, oh my goodness, what God can do. I mean, we sing songs, Lord, change us, transform us. But when we actually start believing that stuff, 
Man, watch what God will do. Man, God, we're going to reach this city. Uh, no, I was thinking of another song. Built this city on rock and roll. That's not the song. <laughs> we're going to reach this city with the love of Jesus. We, we reached this city. Da -da -da -da. I wasn't always saved. I used to listen to secular music. I'm so glad I have those memories, Doc. I, I mean, those melodies are hard to beat. Faith is essential for our Christianity. And I'm not talking about faith just to show up on Sunday, but I, I, I'm talking about faith that moves you on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday when God begins to pour out. I have faith that when I go lay hands on people that, and, and we anoint them with oil, that they will recover. The, 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 the man who was blind, Jesus had called him to him. He says, your faith has made you well. Faith is action. In fact, in Hebrews Chapter 11, verse 1, it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is an action. So faith is essential. Faith is powerful. We have faith. We can move mountains. And let me tell you, friends, that seems like an absurd statement then. Move a mountain. Who can move a mountain? As humans, we have moved mountains. Literally, we can move mountains. We have built islands. Over in Dubai, they have like a whole island network that looks like the, a map of the world. I mean, don't tell me that faith can't move mountains. Friends, faith and hard work can move anything. But I'd ask you this, faith is powerful, and I believe that faith can move mountains, but it says when you pray to move a mountain, don't be surprised that God gives you a shovel. In the physical, mountains can be moved, but I believe that why would we waste our faith moving mountains? Why, why are we wasting our faith on the things that God put in place? We can apply our faith to reaching the lost. We can apply our faith to, to, to saving those who are far from God. I'm out of time. Worship team, would you come? Faith is powerful. Man, I have this story. I'll have to save it for second service. But faith is also freedom. Faith can give us freedom. You know, because we have faith in something, whether, whether we all have faith in something, whether it's in our education, whether it's in our understanding. Let me let you just put you, if you feel like you know it all, God will quickly show you that you don't. I mean, I've been there. I've, I, I've, man, I got everything together. God's, I mean, things are going good. I got all my bills paid. I'm kind of out of debt and, you know, the family's healthy. Oh, everything's great. I got faith in my own abilities to take care of myself. And then, boom. And I get mad at the devil, but really I just begin to have faith in myself. See, faith is, is, not act, is, is activated from a heart that seeks after the will of the Father and acts to bring about His will on the earth. We shouldn't just go around moving mountains for an exercise of faith. Even Jesus said this in John chapter 5, verse 19. He says, Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself, but what He sees the Father do, for whatever He does, the Son also does in like manner. You see, Jesus is, is, is even saying, man, I am the Son of God. I am Jesus, God in the flesh. And, and yet I still just only do the things that I see my Father do. And, and us as believers, when we start to align our faith, when we start to align our works, when we start to align our expression of love on this earth with the will of God in heaven, then things can begin to move that haven't been able to be moved before. Schools can be transformed and changed. Well, the music industry can be transformed and changed. Hollywood, that mountain with the word Hollywood on it, can be shifted and changed and moved by the power of God's love. But the church needs to begin operating in faith and not in defeat. But we have a tendency to put faith in ourselves or others, but not in God. You know, our, our faith is, is, is simply says, well, what can I get? I, I mean, I, you don't know how many times I've heard people who come to church and say, well, I didn't get anything out of that. Well, let me tell you, friends, if you came for church to get something out of it, you came to the wrong place. If you want to get something out of somewhere, go to Chewy's. They'll bring you a meal. When we came here to worship God, we came here to have our hearts transformed. We came here to be sanctified, set free by the power of God's love. It's, the question isn't, what can I get? Or, or, or maybe we don't want to apply our faith because we feel we have a fear of man. What will they say? Oh, man. Pastor, you shouldn't pray in tongues from the pulpit. What are people going to think? 
That I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost? I don't know. What are you saying? The, the, the truth is, is that if we walk around with a fear of man, it, it can cripple us from applying our faith. I was talking to the same person yesterday, and I had to check myself because I said, well, man, if I engage on that level, then, man, the enemy's really going to come after me. Well, how much faith do I have? Maybe I need to put myself into places that really stirs up hornet's nests. Maybe I, I don't need to have a fear of man or a fear of the devil. I just need to do what the Father does. It says, for God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son that none should perish, but all should have eternal life. Well, sometimes we just need to send ourselves to the place of pain. We need to ask ourselves, really, what does God say? It's amazing what can happen when, when we... What can be accomplished when we align ourselves with God's will? How do we do that? John 8, 31, 32, it says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believe, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Our faith should be part of, of abiding in the word of God. Abiding in the body of Christ. If you really want to begin to align your works and your will and your faith where that can move mountains, because I tell you, I'm tired of circling mountains. That's kind of how we feel sometimes. Then we go to church, go to church. Oh, we're going to sing worship songs. We're going to receive an offering. Pastor's going to preach a message. And then I'm going to go home. I'm going to get mad. I'm going to eat. I'm going to watch the saints lose. And then I'm going to come back to church the next Sunday. I'm going to have worship. We're going to receive an offering. I'm tired of going around the mountain. I want to begin to move the mountains in our life. How do we do that? Align our faith with the faith of God. Abide in the Word of God. Abide in the Word. Read your Bible. Get off the TV. Get off of the social media. Delete Facebook. Delete Instagram and all that stuff. Just delete it. They'll be okay without you. I promise. Get into the Word of God. Begin to read your Bible. I know this is some deep stuff right here. Eric, this is all, it's deep, man. Read your Bible. I know. Oh, I came to church. What the pastor said. Read your Bible. Abide in the Word. And then begin to do what it says. Begin to do what it says. Repent. Ask for forgiveness. This is faith in action. It's just that simple. Read the Bible. Do what the Bible says. I believe also abide with people who breathe life into you. Man, quit surrounding yourself with a bunch of people who are speaking curses and, and hatred towards you and start surrounding your, yourself with people who love you. If you come to church for no other reason, it's just to surround yourself with a bunch of spiritual CEOs, those chief encouragement officers who see the, the, the God in your life, who encourage you, who build you up, who lift you up. Now that's, in, that's abiding in the Word. That's abiding in the body. How many of you know the, the Word, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. The Word was God. John chapter 1, verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. Well, how many of you know it? In Ephesians, it talks that the church is the body of Christ. So in, in, a, in a sense, I mean, because I, I'm an intelligent human being that God put faith in and a seed of faith and He put a brain, I can use deductive reasoning and say that, well, the church in essence is the Word of God activated on the earth. And, and is it, that's not even a hard line to draw. I wasn't even that good at drawing by numbers. That when you come to the church, it should be coming into the body of Christ. And that should be a place of encouraging. That should be a place of growth. That should be a place of ministry, a place of love. It should be a place that says, welcome home. Abide in prayer with God. I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. Man, you don't know how many times people have told me, Joe, you can't do that. Joe, you're, you're not smart enough. You're, you're not fast enough. You're not rich enough. Come on, you, you don't have what it takes. You can't do it. I remember the devil. I, I went one time to go buy some parking bumpers, some cement parking bumpers. The owner of the cement parking, I'm there buying 200 parking bumpers, right? This guy didn't have terrible customer service. I walk in there, and, and the devil was just in this guy. He looks at me, and he says, you know, you're never going to be a person of influence. You're never going to be a person that can be used to do anything great in this earth because you don't have what it takes. You might as well just give up now. Your total's $18,000 or whatever it was. I'm like, okay, devil. I swipe the, you know what I mean? But how many of you realize, man, there are people out there 
who speak things over your life and words are powerful. No, I surround myself with people who fill me up with God's love, grace, and mercy because our words are powerful. And Jesus was given an example. He says, Peter, you're amazed that my words withered up a tree. He says, but your words can move mountains. Your, your words can do good. In fact, your words can do more good than I was ever did. And, and, and today, I just want to say today that have faith in God. Don't have faith in yourself. Don't have faith in your work. Have faith in God today. Have faith in God for revival. Can we do it? No. Can God do it? Yes. Can I transform a heart? I've tried. I have sat down with people and I've had to have conversation. I try to reason them them out of out of addiction. I try to reason them out of adultery. I try to reason them out of out of self-loathing and depression. But look, I can't. I can't. But you know who can? God can. Jesus can. It's like you, I just begin to pray, Lord, begin to transform their heart. Lord, let them see what you see in them. Show them their value. Lord, I pray that that little seed of faith that you put in this person at one point in time would be awakened and it would begin to bear fruit in their lives because we were created in the image and likeness of God to have dominion on this earth. And friends, if we ain't doing that, then we ain't living up to our purpose and potential yet. I'm saying God can do it when we begin to have faith in Him. Can we stand together this morning? This morning, there's there's some of you who, who in essence have maybe just Man, doubt and unbelief has begun to creep into your life to the point where it seems impossible. Where where life seems impossible, where my circumstance seems impossible, the the conditions uh, that I'm in today seem impossible, and, and, and this mountain that's in front of me seems impossible, it seems impossible. All I say today is that have faith in God. Have faith in God. And I'm not just talking about a hope little, like I'm going to raise my hand and have faith. And and, and that's hope in God. That's having hope. Hope is good. It begins with hope. Have hope in God. If you don't have faith, have hope. It starts there. And, and And if maybe you don't have faith, then you can actually start believing God, like start reading this Bible and believing the things that it says and believing God. But I want to kind of break past hope and belief for just a moment and go straight into the realm of faith. And that's where transformation begins to happen. That's when I actually start doing the things that God says to do. I love what God says at the end of this story. Jesus says, he says, he says, yeah. And when you pray and you're believing and moving mountains and all that stuff, forgive people. Because if you forgive, God's going to forgive you. It's, it's almost like Jesus is saying, hey, yeah, I know you're excited and you're all this faith stuff. He says, but you need to start doing some heart work here. That's the first step. And so I, this is all I want to do today is maybe I want to just take a step of faith. And, and I had a lot of stuff here I wanted to preach, but God had, we said what we needed to say today. I, I want you to take a step of faith. I, I want you to say, man, I have a mountain in my life. Maybe that mountain is addiction. Maybe that mountain is adultery. Maybe that mountain is, 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 is depression or anxiety. Maybe that mountain is simply that, God, I, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart. I've done too much damage. Man, ain't, I probably, if I had to take a poll, I probably had more DWIs than anybody else in this room. Don't tell me God can't do it. Don't tell me God can't free you from addiction. Don't tell me God can't do it. I had to say to that mountain, be moved. And you know what I had to do? I had to get a shovel and start moving it. But God, help me. Maybe, maybe, maybe you have unbelief about a family member. They're too far gone. That relationship is broken. All I want to do today is just take a a step of faith. I just want us to take one step of faith. And it's not significant. It doesn't change anything, but it can change your heart. It can say, Lord, I'm going to step out. I'm going to say, Lord, I'm stepping out on behalf of somebody else. And I'm not going to allow this mountain of unbelief to have dominion over my life. 
any longer. I mean, even David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff. They comfort me. Even David in the midst of the mountain of death had no fear. He still walked his purpose with God. Why? Because he walked in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. He walked in faith. So this is, I'm, we're just going to pray. I'm going to ask the worship team. We're going to pray and just ask God to break down mountains and move mountains in people's lives. And I don't know what you're believing for, but I'm willing to believe with you. And, and I don't want to have an altar ministry team today. I just want us to look to God. I want us to have faith in God. Just have faith in God. So this is, this is how I want to do it. And, and we're just going to come together in prayer. Would you... If you just need God to just move in your life, maybe you've allowed something in, a, a shadow, would you just respond to the front? Just take a step of faith. Just come to the front. I just want us to take a step of faith here this morning. Take a step of faith. Take a step of faith. And I, I don't have faith in my message. Don't have faith in anything. We're just going to have faith in God here this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. This is, so when you get up here, it's all I want you to do. Come on, I want you just to close your eyes. I just want you to close your eyes. Just lift your hands to heaven. Just lift your hands to heaven. I, it's going to feel weird. I know surrender always feels weird. I, I've done it so many times. It's just, just lift your hands to heaven and say, Lord, I'm putting my faith in you. Come on, come on right here. Right now, I just want us to begin to pray. Say, can you repeat these words after me? Heavenly Father, I come to you today to put my faith in you. I, I lay aside all of my anxieties. I lay aside all of my doubt. I, I lay aside uncertainty. I lay aside unbelief. And I stand here today in faith to you. I believe you. I have hope in you. I have faith in you. Today, as I step forward, I step forward in you. No longer will I believe the lies of the enemy. But I walk in the comfort, the peace, the admonition, the courage, the strength, the hope, and the faith of a loving father. Thank you, Jesus, for helping me. Thank you, Jesus, for taking that step for me. I give you all the glory. I give you all the honor. And I give you all the praise. It's in Jesus' name.